Given that I'm from Karnataka, it makes sense, right? <laughs> Thank you very much and thank you to all the organizers for this invitation and to Sandeep in particular for such wonderful hosting here. Um, so I'm going to be talking about resource allocation meets learning. So I'm going to come back to resource allocation in this talk. Um, this is joint work with Soumya Basu, who's a, who's a PhD student at uh, UT, and Stephen Gutstein and Brent Lance, who are at the Army Research Labs at UT. Okay, so with that introduction, let's, isn't this very noisy? Is this any better? Yeah, way better. Okay, now I just need to figure out how to topologically untangle this thing. Yes. <laughs> All right. So the problem I want to cut. So I'm going to start with a toy, and then from that we'll sort of talk about the general problem. Okay. So system evolves in discrete time. At each time, a batch of images appear to the system. The system has a bunch of classifiers whose confusion matrices are unknown. Okay. So what you want to do is to assign a label to this image and send it out of the system. Okay. Um, so what, there are two things which you want to, you, you care about in this kind of a system. Throughput, meaning how many images can you send out from the system. And the other is accuracy. I mean, you could just tag everything with garbage and send it out. And that doesn't make sense. So you want to also have high accuracy. And I'll define what I mean by accuracy more formally in a couple of slides. Okay? So these are two things which you'd like from this system. So components of the system are these tasks, which are images appearing. Classifiers are agents, which basically have some confusion matrix. Just for people who haven't seen what a confusion matrix definition is, it's simply the following. For each classifier, there's a true label of an object that comes in, an image that comes in. And suggested label by the classifier. And it's just this matrix. This element PAJ is the probability that the classifier labels as B given that the true label is A. So it's uh, row sums are one, it's a probability matrix. That's all a confusion matrix is. Okay? So each classifier is essentially just a confusion matrix. They have different expertise, meaning that the confusion matrices are different for each one of them. Um, the classifiers have frozen labeling, meaning that you can think of it as a pre-trained neural network. You send the same image to it again and again. You're not going to get new labels. You'll get the same thing again and again. It's not a random sample. It is first time you get a, it applies the confusion matrix, but every successive time you send the same object to it, you're going to get the same label, okay? And the throughput comes in from the following constraint that in each time slot, see, remember we are moving in discrete time, each classifier can deal with one image per time slot. Okay. So this is the setting I care about. Let's do some cartoons first before we get serious. Let's say that there are four types of images. There's a cat, a dog, a car, and a truck. Okay. For the next few slides, let's assume that I know the confusion matrices of all the classifiers. Let's just assume I know that. And let's also assume that I know the prior distribution on how these images are generated. So I know some four-dimensional distribution, I know it, and I know these confusion matrices. And in English, I'll sort of say that one classifier is good for animals, meaning that for the animal entries in this confusion matrix, the diagonal elements are large, for, and, the, and the other classifier is a vehicle expert, meaning the diagonal for the vehicle entries are large, and the off-diagonal, and whereas for the other part, it's more noisy. Okay? That's what I mean by animal expert and a vehicle expert. All right, so if you want a safe strategy, what would you do? Every time an object comes in, send it to both of these classifiers, do a, the max likelihood combining of the label. That's the highest accuracy you can get from that. Send that, to, and once you have done that, you send this image out of the system. The throughput of the system, quote unquote, is one image per time slot, and it gives you the accuracy which is the best you can do for the system. Okay, so that's one extreme. The other extreme is, of course, the, that you randomly send an image to each one of these classifiers and accept what you get out of this thing. Okay. 
Okay. This will give you basically a throughput of two images per time slot from the system. The accuracy is of course lower in some average sense. What you'd really like to do is the following. You'd like to do dynamic routing. So you say, let's say that the image is a cat. That's the underlying ground truth. You of course don't know that. You route it randomly. It happens to go to the vehicle expert. It labels it as a dog. But irrespective of whether it labeled it as either a cat or a dog, you wouldn't trust that because that it's giving a, it's giving a label which is not in its area of expertise, essentially. So you want to, based on this label, send it to the other, hold that in your memory, send it to the animal classifier, animal expert, and then you do combine. On the other hand, if, in, if it was a cart, for example, which had gone to the vehicle expert by random routing, and it says it's a cart, you trust it. Um, because you know that it's answering something in its domain of expertise. So this is really what we'd like to study, these kinds of problems. We want to trade off between accuracy and thru throughput, and we'd like to be quote-unquote Pareto optimal. So that's the game, okay? So this, was the, this is the motivation for this kind of problem. So how, how, do you, how would you think about this? Well, you, you can look at this following system where new arrivals, so there's some amount of memory. Initially, there's nothing in memory. A batch of images arrive at each time slot. It goes through the system, meaning some assignment problem is solved. Assign whatever images to these classifiers. You collect labels for each one of these images. And once you collect these labels, this goes into the memory. Now you look at the labels of every one of the images in the system and decide whether you want to send it out of the system. You're happy with whatever the label is or keep it in memory. If you do keep it in memory, there are new arrivals, some with I have some with partial labels already accumulated. Do one more assignment. You will collect, in the, uh, some, some of these objects will get two labels, some would have a one label, and at this point, if there, you decide that maybe I'm happy with certain system, certain objects which being labeled, and you send it out of the system, okay? Hopefully the flow of this dynamical system is clear. It's a discrete dynamical system where labels are being accumulated, and at some point, it's being ejected from the system. So this kind of problem comes in, a, so it's, a, it's a streaming, essentially a streaming David scheme model, meaning the following. You have a time slotted system, k classes of objects, images in this case, um, and m classifiers. These, in this model, I'm going to assume that uh, the that arrivals, that is new images are generated at rate lambda, meaning the expected number is, uh, say, at lambda images per time slot. It's some nice distribution. I'm going to assume for this maybe even a bounded distribution. Okay. Yeah. Um, and of course, classifiers are characterized by their confusion matrix. Most importantly, a classifier's labels for a specific image are frozen, meaning repeatedly sending it to the same classifier multiple times is not going to give you any additional information. You send it once, and that's all you're going to get out of the system. All right. So then, what do we care about? Well. Yeah. I will hold off on your, okay. So the answer is two parts. What, we don't know the confusion. We don't know any of these matrices. The problem I really care about is the following. I don't know any of these matrices. So I don't know who's an expert for what. I don't know the generative model statistics. I know there's a stationary generative model, uh, but I don't know what the probabilities are, okay? And of course, I don't know the ground truth of anything, okay? So this is the setting we are in, and we need to answer all these things. So I'm going to start, for the first about half of this talk, I'm going to assume that I know the generative model and I know the classifier matrices. And then figure out how to actually represent the system. Then what I do is talk about online tensor decomposition to actually figure out this and patch things together. Okay? But just for clarity of uh, sort of uh, exposition, for about first half of this talk, I'm just going to assume I know C and that generative model. Does that, is that clear? Okay. So, we also need to talk about the policy. So remember, what are we, we have to solve an assignment problem each time and an endogenous ejection problem at each time. Endogenous meaning we decide when an object leaves the system. It's not somehow decided by itself, okay? That's the endogenous ejection. And, uh, and assignment meaning may at a point in time, I could take one of the images and send it to all classifiers or do other types of assignments, whatever I'd like to do. There are two things I care about, accuracy 
um, and rate throughput. So what I mean by accuracy is the following. Let's define confidence as the probability that the true, conditional probability that the true label is the same as the final label, where, uh, where final label is assigned by whatever your algorithm is. Here it's the maximum likelihood combining, given all the information. Condition of the history. Then I'd like to have the following, that I want to, I, I give you, I specify that I want confidence greater than or equal to some theta, some quantity, say 0.95, whatever, you, whatever number you have chosen. Of course, there's a problem here that it may just be impossible to get that because I have frozen classifiers. I can't send it again and again and boost accuracy arbitrarily. Okay? So threshold accuracy is a little more subtle. It's one of these two cases. It's either you label with confidence greater than or equal to theta, or it has gone to every classifier in the system once, and that's the best you can do. So that's one side of the metric. The other is rate. Okay? So meaning, how many, how many images do I send out of the system? By definition now, any image that's sent out of the system satisfies this, so it's, it's, it's well labeled. And I want to un un understand the trade-off between throughput and accuracy, and I want to be Pareto optimal, meaning if a pair theta and lambda is achievable, I'd like an algorithm that can actually achieve that. So this is, uh, for people who have worked in sort of resource allocation, this is the equivalent of throughput optimality. This is a generalization in these two dimensions. That's all. So let's spend some time thinking, uh, talking about what lines of work relate to this. Well, really there are three lines of work. The first, of course, goes back to just one shot unsupervised learning. The problem here is the following. You have a batch of samples. This is not a streaming problem. This is a batch problem. You've got a batch of samples without knowledge of the true label. So there's no ground truth. You've got a collection of confusion matrices, which are unknown. And you, at the end of this batch process, you'd like to figure out, you'd like to label all these images. And in the process, maybe, you'd like to learn all the confusion matrices. Okay? But that's not required in this case. So you essentially collect the labels of all classifiers. In this case, every image is sent to all classifiers. Collect the labels, combine it in some manner. There are a whole bunch of algorithms in this space, going back to sort of EM-like algorithms, to voting algorithms, to most recently learning these matrices using tensor decompositions. So what we are looking at is streaming and rate versus accuracy trade-off, but clearly this is sort of the, the line of work that inspires these kinds of questions. A second line of work is budgeted crowdsourcing. So here, again, there's a finite batch of samples at the beginning of time. Classifiers arrive from the crowd, meaning each time you send, a class, send an object to a classifier, it's an independent copy of that same classifier. So I can increase accuracy by just calling the same classifier again and again and sending this object. Okay? The, the motivation for this is crowdsourcing, where you've got a population all the people in this population have the same behavior, but I get, I get to resample from this, this population again and again. And I give you a budget of the total number of actions over this, uh, all these samples, and you want to achieve the maxi max maximum accuracy. So the work in this is Karger, Devarath, and Sewung, and follow up by Sewung and his students in Europe. So that's another line of work. The third line of work, which again makes, uh, is very related to what I'm talking about, is information processing networks. So here, you've got, again, randomized processors and streaming settings. So it's not frozen. That is, you can call these uh, classifiers again and again. But to make things stable, it's an exogenous departure process, meaning at some point the image says I'm done, or the task says I'm done by tossing a geometric coin, and then it leaves the system. Okay? This, uh, again, you want to maximize the arrival rate. This Virat Shah, with Laura Masulier and uh, the, the French crowd. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> Um, so, um, so this is, uh, so these all three things, lines of words are interesting, but uh, sort of we are in this space broadly. So let's come back to our problem. <laughs> what we need to first figure out is, so I've, I've described sort of the system. What is state in this, pro in this bus business and how does state evolve? Let's start with that, because once we understand how to represent state, we can start thinking about assignment algorithms. So it's a belief-valued state, meaning the following. Recall the system. Um, you've got a bunch of images with, uh, with different types of ta uh, tags in it, some which have and eventually some depart, and new ones which come into the system. Let's look at the timeline of what happens. At each time, first, an assignment happens. Given whatever is there in the system, you need to assign them to classifiers. 
with the constraint that each classifier can get only one task or one image at a particular point in time. So that's an assignment. Okay? And then there's a labeling process. The classifiers basically label according to their confusion matrices. So the history is simply the time series of all these events starting from time one to whatever the current time t is. And your state is the following thing. Look, oh, look at all the images in the system. Look at, let tj be the true label of that image. What, look at the probability that the true label is some particular label given the entire history. This joint distribution is what the state of the system is. And based on the state, you need to figure out what to do at the next time step. The assignment needs, depends on the state. And anything you want to deal, any kind of proofs you need to deal with has to sort of show properties of this state. So what, how does this belief evolve? That's really the question. This is a joint distribution of everybody's labels, given the entire history. It would be awesome if you get a product form. Meaning, look, ideally what I'd like to say is the following. Look at a particular image. I don't care what path it took to get to this point in time. Just look at the labels it collected and from whom, and don't even care about anybody else. Okay? That's what this says. Look at the probability that the true label is some value for a particular image J, given its own local history, meaning that it went through a particular collection of classifiers in whatever order that the immaterial, but it got a certain collection of labels. And it's a product form over all images with some appropriate partition function. Is this true? Okay. The, the reason why you would think this could, might not be true is the following. The conditional belief, so this is basically the conditional belief of the true label of a particular <coughs> image. It, it could potentially depend on the entire history of all other coexisting images and their labels because of the scheduling actions that couple it. More specifically, the set of labels acquired by the image depends on the set of classifiers that it went to. Okay? The set of classifiers depended on the scheduling decisions until time t. But those scheduling decisions depend on all the labels that everybody else had gotten. That's how you decided to send somebody somewhere or the other. So such a product form is not apparent immediately. But it turns out, for this particular system, there's this beautiful decomposition which just gives you this product form, which is uh, that, the, that the, the joint distribution of everybody's, of the belief, given the entire history, just depends on the label, for the, the belief for that particular image, given just the labels it has collected. Why is that so? I'll just, uh, I don't want to do a detailed proof. Uh, maybe I'll just talk through this. Uh, so let's look at the same thing in the base form. So I'm interested in, in the base sense, I want to look at, look at the history, the history up to our, our current time t, given the true labels for everybody in the system until now. I want to show that it is a product form, okay? And I want to, I, what I'm going to show is by induction, I will show that this holds. The crux of this argument is, for people who have played with bandits, it's the following thing. A, a bandit algorithm, Let's look at a particular algorithm in one of two different environments. Look at the, look at the action it will take given the history and condition on one environment or the other. The environment doesn't matter because the algorithm just depends on what it has observed to make the next decision. Okay? So in either one of these, so all bandit lower bounds have this kind of a, this, this particular structure mm -hmm. built into it. And that's exactly why, in some sense, this decomposition also holds. In particular, um, it's very late in the day to do a proof. Um, in particular, if you just do the chain rule, at some point you're going to get the following. Look at the probability that a particular scheduling assignment is made, given the entire history up to time t and the true labels. Because the scheduling algorithm is causal, this it condi a further conditioning of the true labels does not matter. This is the analog of sort of con conditioning on the environment as well. And this essentially, after that you plow through the system and you will basically get a product form evolution. Okay, so if belief is indeed product form, in fact, there's a, a, an additional thing that also holds, which is compressed history is good enough. What do I mean by that? Now, at this point in time, I have a whole bunch of images, and all I need to look at is what labels they have to make the next level of next decision. It turns out I don't even need to keep track of it. If I have two images which have the same labels, then as far as I'm concerned, they're equivalent to each other. 
I can't distinguish between either one of them. So I just need to keep counts. I just need to keep counts of states where state is simply the set of labels. Who has labeled me so far? And just keep counts for every one of these state variables. And so now we have answered the question of what is the state that we need to track to make assignment decisions. Okay? All this coming back to Manjesh's question is still, I'm assuming at this point, I know the true distributor, I know the uh, confusion matrices, I know the generator model. Why? Because uh, to make all these assign all these properties which I showed about this product form and all that, assuming that C is known exactly. Okay? So I'm still in that world. <laughs> all right. So I want to use the state decomposition and come up with a way of doing this assignment. Let's look at again a toy problem. There are only two types of objects, cat or dog, and just two classifiers. One which is good for cats, one which is good for both cats and dogs. So state here is the following. An image is null null, meaning it has gotten no label. Cat null, dog null, okay? All the way up to cat cat and dog dog. So there are nine different counters, essentially. That's all I need to keep track of. So at any point in time, I have a vector, a nine-dimensional vector, with counts in each one, saying how many, how many images are there in each one of these things. So let's look at the flow in such a count-based system. I'm going to run through a couple of examples, and then we'll talk about the max flow problem. So let's say that I have a label Q, which is null null, meaning these two have no labels, these images have no labels which have on these things, okay? So, as an example, maybe I send this, the pictures represent the ground truth. At this point, of course, I don't know that. Maybe this, this, I know that this is good only for cats. I send it and it says it's a dog. So, I will send it to the label counter of dog null because it has gotten a label of dog. But I don't send it out of the system because I know this is only good for cats. Um, so it's still in the system. So a blue circle means that it has gone from one label Q to the classifier to another label Q. Okay? So it's moved from one counter to the other. One counter is decremented, another counter is incremented. On the other hand, maybe a different flow is that, it, that the, the classifier which is good for both cats and dogs suggests something. Okay? And so it becomes null with a cat, but then you're done with it. So, meaning that you don't need to store it, you're happy, and you're going to send it out of the system. So an orange co counter is a virtual counter which is outside the system. Blue ones are basically counters which are being tracked. Orange ones are cats which have left the system. And green ones are similarly dogs that have left the system. Okay? So you've got essentially nine counters which tell you what is the, how many are there in each one of these states. And these outside, outside bubbles, which be, these two will just monotonically increase all the time. Okay? I don't care about it. Because as things leave the system, they just go out. And new things always appear to this null null. At this point, therefore, you can think about this bipartite graph. Okay? There are nine label queues. Arrivals occur only to this null null queue. New, new objects keep adding to that. There's a bunch of classifiers on the other side of the bipartite queue. You are doing a flow assignment from the labels, label queues to these to these classifiers. From these classifiers, there's a flow back into the label queue or into these special queues, which are out of the system. And you know, the, your algorithm will make sure that, suppose your algorithm makes sure that it will go into these queues only if the threshold accuracy is met. Then what you have remaining is a max flow problem. You want to find an assignment which will maximize the flow from this, the entry to the null null through whatever this black box to the union of these red and green. Okay? So this is, a max, this is a straight max flow problem um, for which if you know all the statistics, you can find the assignment to solve this max flow problem. So at this point, given an accuracy requirement theta, I've showed you how to sort of use the state decomposition to describe the Pareto region. So meaning one axis is a throughput, the other axis is theta, I know now how to describe that region. Okay. Good. But, you, so now how do you convert this max flow to an actual algorithm? All I've done so far is describe the region. Okay. So, 
since I've been talking about this region, it's essentially the following. Set of uh, arrival rates and threshold tuples so that the expected number in the system is uh, finite. The expected value is less than infinity. That's basically what I'm going to define as the Pareto region. And as I just described right now, it's really a max network flow problem which, will, which can be used to understand this region. So let's go back to this picture. From these label queues to this classifier, the flow is under my control as the assignment problem. But from these classifiers to how things flow out, it's not under my control. But can we compute sort of the flow rates for each one of them? I claim the answer is yes. If you indeed know the confusion matrices, and you indeed know the priors, then for each one of these states, you can compute the conditional probability that a particular classifier will label, will make a particular labeling decision, which will give you a probability flow. Uh, if given a particular flow here, I can compute the flows there, and therefore, this part of the flow can be computed based on this assignment. Good. If you keep that in mind, then you have the following flow view of this thing. Look at this, a particular node. If you do use an assignment on it, it will decrement by one. And then you look at it on the other side and figure out the net input flow to that because of whatever assignment decision you made. So that is essentially a rate, there's a departure of at least one, and ingress based on the arrivals from all these classifiers. This is effectively the rate that's coming into a counter, and this is the weight of the counter. So all 30 years of max flow says that what you should do is look at sort of the rate, though this is used in a very different sense because the rate actually is, it depends on the system itself in some weird manner, it depends on the assignment itself, as opposed to sort of the, all the network problems in where the rate is independent or exogenous to the system. There's an endogenous rate, okay? But you'd look at this particular max weight and do this assignment, and can you show that this max weight algorithm at each point in time will, if I just do this, can it be Pareto optimal? And the answer turns out to be yes, using a Lyapunov argument. Okay. I'm not going to go into that. Uh, it's uh, related to the standard ones with some, some twists around it, but uh, that's fine. So taking stock of where we are. So if you have gotten, if you know the, if you know the confusion matrices, if you know the arrivals, um, then we know how to essentially do the assignment problem, how to represent state, how to evolve beliefs, how to do the assignment problem, and give you Pareto optimality. I want to, since this sort of, I, I, when I looked at the schedule, it, it, there's a big tutorial aspect to this, uh, this workshop, so I wanted to spend some time actually doing a tutorial. So what I'm going to do is, first, I'll quickly give you a theorem statement, then I'll do a deep dive into how to do tensor decompositions to learn confusion matrices. That's uh, what we are doing is to just adapt that work with some modification, but the heavy lifting has been done in prior work. But I thought I should talk about that heavy lifting because it's interesting for a tutorial style conference. Okay, so all we do is an epsilon greedy bandit. Okay, very simple. With probability one by tau, you send the sample to all classifiers. And we say that an alpha beta oracle has the following property. If with n samples, it, uh, with L1, so with an L1 norm error, it outputs a confusion matrix and true probability vector whose L1 error is at most n to the minus alpha and with probability at least one minus uh, n to the minus beta. Okay, this is just an alpha beta oracle. It's a black box. You can adapt essentially with some modifications. You can adapt prior work and generate a roughly 0.51 oracle. Okay, and that's what I've got to spend some time talking about how, how this is done. But if you do indeed have this kind of an oracle, then you're done. Because now you've patched together this epsilon. You have to do this online learning of these matrices along with the flow thing, put everything together, crank through, and essentially the ideas I told you all come together to give you the following. That as long as you're an interior of this region, then this algorithm is Pareto optimal. And indeed, you can actually see this in operation. Um, if, you, if you look at, so we did some CFAR10 experiments. Um, with different uh, neural network classifiers, all of which are not comparable with each other for different categories, three groups of, uh, three label groups, and x-axis arrival rate, y-axis accuracy, and the size of the bubble is essentially how many images lie in memory, okay, in the system. So it's the equivalent of Q-line. As you are sort of very close to 
0 comma 0, anything you do, any assignment, it's going to work. As you go towards the boundary, the backlog increases, basically the delay of a queuing system. And you can see how the boundary gets traced out in practice. This actually works. Okay, and you can do it for different types of uh, uh, experiments. But uh, let me go back sort of to the tutorial side of this. Yes. Just mean delay. This is the equivalent of, so the analog of this is, all I'm giving you the guarantee is the expected number in the system is less than infinity. As you approach the boundary, it's going to blow up to infinity. But even well inside the boundary, this algorithm does not guarantee it's the minimum over all. It doesn't give you any delay guarantee or the equivalent of delay of the size guarantee. All it says is that this, if somebody can stabilize the system, this algorithm will do that too. Nothing more. I don't give any additional guarantees over that. Okay. Absolutely. Um, so you don't even care how long it takes you to learn, so long as within an epsilon ball of whatever. What, what, do you, what do you mean by learn? You want to learn to use the confusion matrices. That's I want to do this, I want to learn this confusion matrices while being stable. If I learn at too low a rate, the queues are going to build up. Okay, so there's a learning aspect, which is this one by tau process. I need to learn it well enough so that I don't make too many mistakes. Because if I do, then m m my system is unstable, meaning I can choose a lambda and a theta, which is out. So that's me. So there is that trade-off also that needs to be played, and that's how these parameters come. You need to learn fast enough, but you don't want to learn too much because you're wasting too much. Loose. If you use a constant fraction, then you, you automatically lose throughput. So, but those kinds of trade-offs are the usual ones. So I'm not really highlighting any of that. So let's go back to learning confusion matrices and how would you do this kind of a thing? It's really an equation solving kind of problem. So let's suppose there are just two types of images, a cat and dog and two classifiers, okay? So I've got two two by two matrices, which I don't know. I've got a prior distribution, the probability that it's a cat, a probability it's a dog, which I don't know, and I want to learn all of that. What I could do is do the, let's look at the population infinite sample limit. I take every image and send it to all the class, both the classifiers and collect the statistics of what did each classifier do with it. Let's look at the first one. The probability cat cat is simply the fraction of images that were both labeled as cat. Okay. There's no noise. This is the population limit. Okay. Really you need to work with samples. What this is, we would, you would replace this by the empirical average. But in the population limit, these, these quantities are known exactly. Beta is the probability that the quantity is a dog. Okay, so then just some total probability, the probability that something is labeled as a cat cat is, well, suppose it's a dog with probability beta and both get it wrong. So one minus D1, D1 was a probability that the first classifier would do a dog. Okay, so it's one minus D1 times one minus D2. Plus, suppose it's a cat, it's C1, C2. Okay, so these, and similarly, you can write these four equations. So. If you, these are basically five polynomial equations in which I know these quantities from data. I don't know any of these quantities, but there are five unknowns and four equations, so you cannot solve the system. However, this idea is useful because if you have M classifiers and K classes, you get K to the M equations. Okay? Um, but the number of, but the, the matrices, the row sums are one, and so the number of parameters is order K square. Uh, it's exactly k times k minus 1 because the row sums are 1. And there are m matrices. For the distribution, there's k minus 1. So it turns out that at least the number of equations you'll get is greater than the number of unknowns as long as m is greater than or equal to 3. So theoretically, if you had a polynomial solver, okay, with three classifiers, you could actually solve these. If, if you had a black box, it could potentially solve this. How to solve these equations is not clear, and that's where tensor decompositions come in. So, Again, this is all, this, this is all like prior work. This is sort of a tutorial aspect. This is not what we developed. So what is a tensor? Well, an order M tensor is simply a multidimensional array. A tensor with I coordinates, um, you, you, a matrix has two, a tensor is uh, M dimensional. One particular tensor that we care about for this particular, for what we are doing is the tensors generated using M matrices, V1, V2 to Vk, okay? So I have, a, I have these matrices. Each matrix is a K cross K matrix. In this case, it's 
just the classifier. Um, and the order and tensor is simply the following. Pick the first column of every one of these vectors, uh, of these matrices. Look at the outer product of those. Okay. So meaning this particular quantity here is look at the vector from these various uh, from the matrices. Look at the first call. Look at the and then a particular element there would be pick the i tell pick the i one element from the first one, i two element of the second one, i three element of this one. Multiply that. That scalar is t i one i two i m just for the inside. Similarly, do that for every single column and add it up. So this, so this is called an order m ten tensor of rank k. Okay. And so what we'd like to do is the following. If you could, quote unquote, observe this tensor, can you go back and recover those matrices? That's really the question. And you see the connection to what we are doing. I'll make it more explicit. We, but uh, it's clear what the connection is. And it turns out the tensor un unique decomposition theorem says that if something called the K rank of these matrices satisfies a particular condition, uh, which depends on the rank and, uh, and, um, uh, and the order of this tensor, then indeed there exists a unique decomposition. And the K rank is simply the following. A K rank of a, vector, a matrix V is at least K if all size K sub, uh, subset of columns of V are linearly independent. Okay? So this is what is called the K rank. And based on the K rank, it says there's a unique decomposition. Again, there's no algorithm yet. We're just talking about existence. Okay. So now that you have that, the connection to us is the following. You have confusion matrices, and you have these uh, the true label distributions. So the probability that you'll get a particular label from these uh, matrices, how many minutes do I have left? Okay, I'll wrap up in 10, good. Um, so, it can be written as this, uh, this is total probability. But if you want to write this, you can just rewrite this as this particular tensor. It is, you look at the, you look at a particular row of this matrix, Look at the transpose, that's the vector. Look at the tensor product, the outer product of that, weighted by the, 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 the true generative model, add it over L. So this is P is essentially a tensor of whose, uh, whose order is essentially um, M, because that's the number of uh, matrices there, and the rank is K. Those are the, that's basically the number of types that they are. Good. And so you just stick it in, you can get just apply Kruskal's theorem, you'll get the unique recoverability. Again, we haven't yet come to an algorithm. All we are saying is, there is, it is possible to solve these polynomial equations. So, this is how, so, so, so far I just talked about general tensors. Now I want to go to algorithms. And this is based off of two papers, one by Zhang and colleagues. Uh, the, this is uh, Mike Jordan uh, and his group. And the other is going to be Anand Kumar and colleagues. This is uh, Sham Kakade, Anand Telgarski, Anand, and a whole, whole bunch of collaborators. Okay. So these are the two papers out of which this part is based off. Okay. So you want to solve a, a tensor problem of uh, rank K, okay? because uh, the summation is over the number of types that are. That's hard to deal with. So you want to first reduce it to three groups. All you do is the following. First create super classifiers, which is basically group, uh, partition this confusion matrices into three groups, and just average it over each one of them. And the way you can essentially generate samples from this average is anytime you're calling, a per, anytime you're doing a label, anytime you want to do a labeling, randomly select one from each pool and send it. By uniformly sampling within each group, effectively you're creating just these these uh, super classifiers. Okay? So you want to first reduce it to just three super classifiers. Suppose you have three super classifiers, then now at least uh, you said uh, it's a third order tensor. In tensor language, it's something still called a non homogeneous tensor. The reason is these classifiers are not identical, these classifiers are different. So these, co these vectors, the co corresponding columns of these things are different. So this is a non homogeneous tensor you need to homogenize this or whiten them. So there's a method where 
again, if you are lost, what, where we are is the following. This is something we can observe from data. This is what we need to figure out, okay? So, good. I need to homogenize it. So there's, a, there's, a, there's considerable algebra, and um, I'm not going to get into that. But there's a way of transforming from P tilde, which can observe, to some other tensor M, but which gives you things which are homogeneous and which, for which you can do power iteration. That's, that's where it gets to. Okay. So now, again, you, if you go through the algebra, you can get unique recoverability conditions for this. And uh, so the algorithm essentially is you, you want to solve this using tensor power method, uh, which is the analog of matrix power method, but with is much, much more delicate. And this is what that JMLR paper, uh, the 2014 Anand Kumar's paper is about. Um, and now, once you have figured out the super classifiers, you can actually figure out what individual classifiers are by using these as basically landmarks. Uh, this is some more linear algebra. Basically, you send an image to a super classifier and to a particular classifier from a different pool. So you'll get, you'll get some, this, sum of pro this sum of products form from which, for which you not only know this side because from data, but you also know these super classifiers because you've learned that. And so you can learn everything else using some matrix inversion methods. So I've gone through this very quickly, but hopefully you get a flow, of, a sense of how you go about solving this kind of a problem. So this flowchart summary is for each time tau, where you explore with probability one by tau, and you do tensor decomposition, you recover the you recover the uh, individual confusion matrices, and this is basically what you can get out of Zhang, uh, Zhang and collaborators and Anand Kumar and collaborators. There's still a block version. So the trivial way to sort of run this black wo block version is the following. If you are in an explore time slot, do some pre-processing, run tensor power iteration, generate a collection of confusion matrices. You would argue, then you're done until the next time when you get new data. Why do you need to do any additional computation? The problem with tensor power iteration is that uh, it's very initial condition dependent. It, it's not going to, it doesn't necessarily, you, you can't give guarantees on correct recoverability. So what you do here in that, within a box is choose a random set of initial conditions, generate some and give some high probability bound. If you want independence across time, you need to repeat this process every time slot to generate new confusion matrices in spite of the fact that you don't have, uh, you don't have new data until the next explore. And with that, you can, uh, you can get a sort of a typical, you can get the, the, the appropriate bounds, but the computation is going to scale with time. Extremely slowly, I give you, but still, it's going to increase with time. Turns out you can do something else. So, this, again, this is going into the, into the black box of how tensor power iteration works, but you can do initial conditions which take a random amount of time, but will give you a good one with probability one. So you can, use the, you can use that as a black box and adapt it in, I'm not even going to get into the details, 537, um, to, to how, how you would go about doing that. And the summary of that is that you can get an order one initialization, order one time complexity, order one number of amortized uh, tensor power iterations, and get things to work. Yeah, basically, but again, all the heavy lifting has been done in the previous papers. This is sort of some tweaking with that, this part of it. But in, so the, in summary then, what we have, if you put these things together, is uh, what I start, we have unknown confusion matrices, um, unknown uh, generative model, but you can figure that out and solve the flow problem by sort of combining resource allocation and, that, and this, this tensor level. Because there's a whole bunch of interesting problems which are there, including what you asked, right? I mean, this, this, doesn't, this, just, this just gives you stability. You need, you want way more. You want to say that I want to minimize an amount of memory. Or you want to solve the other problem. Given an accuracy, so can you maximize threshold accuracy given an arrival rate? That's not what we are doing here. Or um, what, how, how much do you lose by just simple algorithms or majority voting or things like that? Again, I don't know. But uh, that's, that's where we are. And uh, all the actual references for the papers I talked about are available here. Thank you very much.
Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. So the what? How? Because remember, I know the confusion matrices. So therefore, I can do the combining of all the labels using the confusion matrices and the generator model. Of course, the ones I'm going to use in the algorithm is that that's appearing from the TPI. So at each time slot, whatever that algorithm returns, that's what I'm going to use to to basically do the aggregation and flush things out. And There is no, this is not about majority voting at all. This is actually, this is maximum likelihood combining, essentially. So if the classifiers disappear over time, then it's sort of a hybrid model of what uh, Devrath has worked on previously, where each time you don't get independence, but you, you know, for a certain number of times it's frozen and then something else comes up. Okay, and this one, that's a good question. Yeah, I, I, I don't have an immediate answer to that. The human agent we were thinking about were, again, um, some of my collaborators are interested in uh, brain machine interfaces on humans wearing basically a helmet, getting, showing images, getting signals out of humans and doing classification. Um, that's, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, that's, that's sort of how this project started. But, yeah. If you were allowed to send it back to the same classifier and get an independent example Yeah, uh, yeah, not sure. I don't know. I, I need to think about it, but that's a good question. I, I'm not sure even if it reduces directly to what, no, not quite, because you don't have the accuracy. It's some hybrid of what uh, the new Devrath's and collaborators papers and this one. That's really the way we are. I don't, I can't give you an exact answer off the bat. Thank you very much.